In this video, we're going to look at the standard Gibbs energies associated with reactions. So we've defined the Gibbs free energy using the following equation. So we have delta G is equal to delta H minus delta S. Right, so, oh, T delta S. So we have this equation for, to define the Gibbs free energy. And we have standard enthalpies and entropies that we've already defined. So the standard Gibbs free energy is just the sum of both of those, right? So we'll have the standard uh, entropy and the standard enthalpy. That will give rise to a standard Gibbs energy for a chemical reaction, right? So just like these values for the enthalpy and the entropy are tabulated in tables and textbooks and online, you can get similar standard Gibbs energies uh, for chemical reactions as well. But what I want to do is kind of start thinking about what these terms mean for a chemical reaction so we can kind of look at what the Gibbs energy is actually telling us, right? So for the enthalpy, right, with a chemical reaction, the enthalpy change is really largely coming from contributions of bonds being broken or formed, right? So this is really a contribution from bond breaking. So contribution from bond breaking. Right, so as, as bonds are, are broken or formed, they release or absorb energy to, to make that process happen. And the accumulation of those determine whether our reaction is exothermic, endothermic, what have you, right? Uh, so that delta H term is really primarily the contribution from bonds being broken or formed throughout a chemical reaction. Now, this T delta S term, right, that balances this, this free energy definition out, uh, this really comes from any other interactions that molecules can do, right? Stuff like rotations, vibrations, right? Um, really, that's what we're looking at when, we, when we're thinking about this term with entropy, right? So we talked about entropy as the dispersal of energy, right? A lot of that energy is dispersed in, a term, in the form of molecular vibrations, rotations, and uh, translations, all these other things that molecules can do um, that are involved in chemical reaction that don't have to do with bond breaking and formation. So this delta S term is really dealing with molecular vibrations. And I'll just, I'll just say vibrations, right? So it's just kind of classifying everything as, as some sort of molecular level vibration, rotation, what have you. Right, so it's really the interplay between this energy that is released or gained from bonds being broken or formed respectively and what's going on on a molecular level as far as vibrations and rotations of molecules that occur throughout a reaction process, right? So, um, so given this expression, right, given this equation, you can kind of think about scenarios where the delta G would be negative or positive, right? So we just looked at in the last video that the spontaneity criteria for delta G is that it be less than zero, right? You probably already knew that punchline even before I said it. You've been, you know, in organic chemistry had to analyze delta G values to determine spontaneity. You may not have known where it came from thermodynamically, but you've been using delta G as an arrow for spontaneity for quite some time now. So, um, so now we, we want to be able to look at this expression and say, okay, where is delta G going to be negative? Where is it going to be positive? Uh, what do those different scenarios look like? Right? So what I'm going to do is produce a little table. So let's say on, on this column we'll have delta H, this column will have delta S, and this column will have delta G. Right? And those will be our labels. Right? And then on each row, what I'm going to do is show the sign for delta H and delta S and see what the outcome will be for delta G. Right? Sometimes it'll vary depending on the temperature. So the first scenario is if delta H is negative and delta S is positive. Right? So this is saying that we have an exothermic reaction that is increasing in entropy. This is always going to be spontaneous, right? Because that means that delta G will always be negative. Your delta H is negative. This term is negative, so your entropy change is not changing that. So this is always going to be spontaneous. So it's always spontaneous in the case where your 
reaction is exothermic and the entropy change is positive, right? Now, um, f let's look at another scenario. So what if enthalpy is positive and the entropy is positive? So we've got an endothermic reaction with an increase in entropy. Well, in this case, it's going to depend, right? It's going to depend on the temperature. If the temperature is really high, then this second term is going to dominate the delta G expression and it'll be negative. But if the temperature is low, then that means that the enthalpy term will dominate and it'll be positive and non-spontaneous. So at high temps, at high T, it'll be spontaneous. But at low temp, it'll be non-spontaneous. Right, so it'll depend, right? In, in this case where both of them are positive, is going to depend on whether you're looking at the process at high or low temperature. Okay, so next scenario, what about if they're both negative? And let me section off all of these guys. So what if they're both negative, right? We end up with delta H and delta S being negative. So we've got an exothermic reaction. It has a decrease in entropy. Well, here again, it's going to depend, right? So in this case, if delta S is negative, if you have a decrease in entropy, then that means that this is going to be negative. This whole term is going to be positive since there's a negative out front. So that means that at high temperatures, this will be non-spontaneous. So you have high temp, this one will be non-spontaneous. And at low temps, right, you're going to have this guy be, um, be mostly, uh, well, this guy is still positive, right? But if um, it's at a lower temperature, then that means that this negative delta H is going to dominate the delta G expression. So at low T, you have a spontaneous reaction. Right, and the last scenario that we haven't considered yet is if delta H is positive and delta S is negative. Under this scenario, you have an endothermic reaction that is, has a decrease in entropy, right? So that means that this term is gonna be positive, the enthalpy is positive, so this is always going to be non-spontaneous. So always non-spontaneous. Right, so you can look at the signs of delta H and delta S respectively. And from that, you can tell whether your reaction is going to be spontaneous or non-spontaneous by looking at how these, uh, the interplay between these two affects the sign of delta G. Now, a last note here with uh, delta G's, standard delta G's for uh, reactions. Since delta G is composed of state functions, it is also itself a state function. And the same goes for the Hemholtz free energy, but we're kind of talking about Gibbs now. So this, this guy is a state function. So it also follows Hess's law, right? So if we wanted to get the delta G for a reaction, Right, so let's say we want to get a delta G for a reaction. Then we would just need to sum up the delta G of the products. Right now you see for your stoichiometric coefficient. So stoichiometric coefficient, and then you would just get the standard uh, delta G for the products. Plus or minus. the sum of the delta G for the reactants. Right, so just like all the other state functions, entropy, uh, enthalpy, all these other things follow Hess's law in this way, you can use the same Hess's law relationship for uh, delta G, right? And this will specifically have to be the delta G's of formation, right? So you put formation, but these will have to be the formation Gibbs free energy. So if you have the delta G of formation for all of your um, related products and reactants for your reaction, then you can get the total delta G for the reaction as well.